Okay. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Uh, thank you all for coming on a Thursday afternoon. Uh, I'd just like to uh, give a few words of introduction before we start uh, start our presentation today. As you know, or may or may not know, SAIS Europe has a number of partner schools, Bologna, University of Bologna, Diplomatic Academy of Vienna, Leiden University, Sciences Po Lille, our Nanjing campus in, uh, in China, McGill University, SOAS, and Tel Aviv. And this year, we began a visiting fellows program uh, with our partners. And so far, we've had no fewer uh, than four uh, partners come from, uh, visiting fellows come from partner schools. Azar Gat came from Tel Aviv, Lindsay Black and uh, Santino Rihelma came from uh, Leiden, and Sami Maki came from uh, Lille. Now, these visits have already led to several fruitful academic interactions between our institutions, and I hope they will lead to more. Some of you may have seen that... Uh, uh, Gabriel Calabro sent, uh, re sent round for the third time an invitation for, uh, for Maya students to send a um, abstract for, for a graduate conference being organized by Leiden uh, in June. Uh, and that was a direct result of the visit of Professor Rihelme. And we will provide up to 200 euros in funds. Anyway, all of this is not all of this is not to detract from our speaker today, because our latest visiting speaker is from is Jennifer Welsh from uh, McGill University, from the Max Bell School of Public Policy at McGill. Uh, Professor Welsh is uh, the Canada 150 Research Chair in Global Governance and Security at McGill with teaching appointments, as I said, at the Max Bell School of Public Policy and the Department of Political Science. And she also serves as the director of the Center for International Peace and Security Studies, which I'm guessing the acronym is pronounced SIPS, but I might be wrong. Yeah, SIPS, you got it. She was previously professor and chair of international relations at the European University Institute in Florence, and Professor of International Relations at the University of Oxford, where she co-founded the Oxford Institute for Ethics, Law and Armed Conflict. Between 2013 and 2016, she served as Assistant Secretary General and Special Advisor to the Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, on uh, working on issues connected with the doctrine of responsibility to protect, to protect uh, a subject on which she has written a great deal and of which she can claim to be one of the progenitors. Uh, Professor Welsh has frequently provided input into policy initiatives for the Canadian government, uh, as well as the United Nations, uh, as, and was one of the uh, principal authors of the Canada 2005 International Policy Statement, which is the most recent comprehensive foreign policy strategy document of the Canadian state. In 2016, she gave the CBC, the Canada Broadcasting uh, Company, Massey Lectures, uh, which uh, was subsequently published as the return of history, conflict, migration, and geopolitics in the 21st century. Created in 1961, in honor of Vincent Massey, a former Governor General of Canada, the lectures have been given at various times by Martin Luther King Jr., Willie Brandt, Noam Chomsky, John Kenneth Galbraith, my favorite economist, Doris Lessing, the Nobel Prize winner, Carlos Fuentes, who I think also won the Nobel Prize, Charles Taylor, the famous philosopher, Connor Cruz O'Brien, and Michael Ignatia, uh, the famous philosopher of human rights. Professor Welsh will actually be returning to SAIS Europe in October 2024 and will be teaching a short course on a subject of her expertise and more details will follow about that soon, I hope. In the meantime, she will also be teaching in Professor Hall's class tomorrow. Jennifer, we're delighted to have you here. The floor is yours. Thank you.
oh, there's no women on that list. But then Margaret McMillan uh, also gave the Massey lectures, and you'll be seeing Margaret. She'll be coming here at the uh, at the end of at the end of May. Very nice to be here. I'm so happy we have a partnership between our two institutions, and nice to be able to talk to you about um, some work that I'm in the midst of, but also some of it is getting close to publication. And I wanted to give you um, some background on, on what I'm gonna speak to you about today. It forms part of a broader book project I'm finishing, which is called Sovereignty as Responsibility. I'll, I'll talk more about that. But also this particular argument that I present to you this afternoon is in a book project. How many of you have heard of John Eikenberry, the US foreign policy writer? So he has put together a book on the 1990s, arguing whether there were missed opportunities or wrong roads taken in the 1990s at the end of the Cold War. It's very typical John Eikenberry. And he forced us to only think about the 1990s, not to beam ahead to what we know happened afterwards and to ask questions about that decade. So one of the things um, I do in the, in the paper, you know, there's chapters on globalization, neoliberalism, NATO expansion, you can well imagine that was a topic of the, uh, in the book. I was given the task of writing about human rights in general, right? So of course you can't write about human rights in general in one chapter, so I focused it really on particular ideas that were associated with human rights. But I think it's also worth, particularly in a room of students, reminding you that even though human rights are in the preamble to the UN Charter, it was really only in the 1990s that they became what we might think of as the third stool of the UN. It was only in the 1990s that the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights was actually created. Um, and so that's that's important to remember. And so what I do in the paper, and this speaks to my IR development, was I ask how revolutionary were the two ideas that I'm going to talk to you about uh, from the 1990s. And to do that, I use the concept of revolutionism that was introduced by Martin White. So how many in this room have heard of Martin White? So interesting. So this tells us, okay, so Nina has, so this tells us about where we learn international relations, right? So I was educated in Britain. So when you learn North America, and I include McGill in this, North American IR, you learn about realism, liberalism, constructivism. But when Martin White taught international relations at the LSE in the 1950s and 60s, he had different paradigms, which he called realism, rationalism, and revolutionism as his traditions for thinking about approaches to international politics. And he always started his lectures, which by the way, were riveting um, and you can find them. He always started with revolutionism because he argued that really we need to understand as international relations thinkers, what were the big challenges to international order? And he said, really there were three because, you know, of course, he didn't live to see the end of the 20th century. So we had three big revolutionary moments in international order. One was the 16th and 17th centuries, when we were talking about a community of Christianity. Then we had the Jacobin period, where at least in the initial phases, the French revolutionaries had a grand transnational ideology. And then, of course, Bolshevism in the early 20th century. And what I ask in the paper is, should we think about the liberal ideas of human rights as they were articulated in the 1990s as revolutionary in terms of their um, effect on or their aspirations for international order? And this slide is important because when we think about ideas of human rights, we often think about them in the framework of the UN declaration and the treaty bodies, that individuals have these inalienable rights and they impact state responsibility through various mechanisms, advocacy, domestic pressure. But what really developed in the 1990s is what Charles Bites and to a certain extent, um, Jean Charvet have called a doctrine of international human rights. And that was this idea, not just that individuals have rights, but individuals are subjects of global concern, 
and the responsibilities to protect and promote human rights should extend across political boundaries. They're not just about encouraging a state to do things for its own um, citizens. So what I do in this paper is I look at two manifestations of human rights thinking. Sovereignty is responsibility and individual criminal accountability. Uh, and I'll try to get through um, a very brief overview of, of these before I, uh, I, I take your questions. So the claim underpinning sovereignty as responsibility is that we've seen a shift from the Hobbesian conception of sovereignty of absolute control over particular territory, absolute authority, to a more conditional understanding of sovereignty articulated by some in that doctrine of, of the responsibility to protect. So the idea, the claim of liberals is that the meaning of, so of sovereignty has been transformed. And I'm talking in, in the time period of the 1990s, right? They're arguing it's been transformed from a right of absolute state authority to the idea that sovereign rights are conditional on a state fulfilling core responsibilities. So that's the first um, idea. The second revolutionary idea is a new understanding of immunity and accountability, moving from a state-based model of accountability for wrongs in international society to one where, and I always struggle in a class of new students to get across just how big a change this is, that individuals can be subjects of international law, that individuals in particular roles can be held accountable for their acts. We had centuries of state responsibility and by implication, state immunity from responsibilities. And we moved partly in post-World War II developments, but mostly in the 1990s to an individual criminal accountability model. So let me say just a little bit about, um, and that claim, let me just finish here, is that any individual who commits widespread and systematic violations of human rights, what is sometimes called atrocity crimes in, in the way that I and others write about it, regardless of their status. So you can read here, regardless if they're state leaders or not, or their function should be criminally accountable, right? So those are the two ideas I wanna play with. So let me unpack the first one a little bit and give you um, uh, some of the origins of this idea. So what you began to see in the 1990s was scholarship in international relations, but also in international law that was arguing that sovereignty itself, its meaning had been reshaped. So it wasn't that human rights were just a constraint on sovereignty. They were part of the very understanding of what sovereignty meant. And I think the second point is really important here, that states were legitimized less by their control over territory and more by their ability to ensure the political rights of their citizens. So if you're familiar with the work of Sam Barkin or Nicholas Wheeler or other constructivists of the, of the 1990s and 2000s, they make this claim about changing ideas of sovereignty. You also have this move in international law, right? You begin to see scholars like Alan Buchanan, but also Tom Frank, who write about state recognition being not on the basis of whether you tick the boss boxes of empirical sovereignty, you control territory, you control a population, but whether you guarantee rights, particularly minority rights inside your territory, right? And you also had very strong claims on the behalf of some international lawyers that a, a new law of humanitarian intervention was developing. And finally, some of you may know the work of Ruti Titel, who wrote a very well-known book called Humanities Law, where she said a new body of law is developing globally, which is in essentially a manifestation of human security, that the international order is about peoples as much as states. And I recommend her book as a real product of that time. When you read it, it really is an encapsulation of the, the set of ideas that I'm talking about. But what I'm interested in is that this just wasn't in the ivory tower, right? You began to see in policy practice a number of manifestations of the ideas of sovereignty as responsibility. And one person I'm going to talk about more, I'd love to elaborate because I find him fascinating, 
um, is Francis Deng, who was a, an African diplomat, who was the UN Secretary General's first special representative on internally displaced peoples, right? And you need to remember who IDPs are, right? They're not refugees. They are people who have been displaced but do not cross an, an international border. And Deng stood, up, Deng stood up and said, these people need international protection. Their state has failed to provide for their rights. And then, of course, you also had sovereignty as a responsibility as a baseline of idea, idea of the development of the principle um, of the responsibility to protect. So that's where the idea comes from. Now, there's a few things that are interesting about sovereignty as responsibility as an idea. And I play with this more in my longer book. The first is, and I have an inadverted commas, because this is one of the arguments I like to make, is it asserts a novelty, right? That there's a new understanding of sovereignty. There's a shift that we've seen in the 1990s. Um, Richard Haas, George Bush's head of policy planning said, you know, sovereignty is no longer a blank check. We're going to hold sovereign actors accountable. Um, I, I actually interrogate whether it, it is so new, whether we can, and I think it's based on a very idealized conception of what sovereignty was in the Cold War. And, and in fact, an incorrect assessment of what sovereignty was, but that's for Q and A perhaps. Um, but it's also, when you think about it, based on social contract theory. So very few of these thinkers are saying, we, I want the state to be obsolete, transcend states. They're not complete utopians. They're talking instead about really going back to the origins of the social contract, that populations give up their liberties for government, but in return, expect the fulfillment, not just of their protection, but in some social contract theory, a more expansive uh, conception of rights. But I think what is revolutionary about some of these um, ideas is that unlike the social contract theorists, there's an assertion of some kind of authority outside the state. You have in this period reference to the international community, um, international jurists, the idea that international law and international organizations should abandon very strict forms of neutrality towards domestic principles of legitimacy, towards the type of regime that exists inside the state. And this is what is arguably new about the 1990s. And those of you who are interested in this, I recommend a book by Anne Orford, the international lawyer on international authority and the, and the responsibility to protect. And what I would suggest is that's moving us from what you've all learned as good IR students, you know, is a horizontal distribution of power between sovereign states to one that begins to look a bit more vertical, where we have an international authority standing um, above states. Deng's alternative, and this is the, the kind of mini argument lurking in my paper, was one that, I, that didn't go as far as redistributing uh, authority in that way. He was very concerned about legitimizing co coercive action in, in semi-liberal or liberal societies. Instead, his goal was to create a partnership between post-colonial states and the international community in ways that would provide greater security for individuals. And there's an analogy with the Helsinki process. It was something that developed in Africa in the early 90s among a set of young leaders called the Kampala process where they began and Deng really pinned his hopes on these young leaders exercising collective leadership for the populations of Africa. And what's really interesting about this as a closing thought is you, know, you hear a lot about uh, Western interventionism in Africa being the problem. Deng's worry was lack of Western action in Africa. He said, if the end of the Cold War means that other states simply disappear from the continent, that is going to be a disaster. We need to think instead about how we reconceive a partnership between post-colonial states. And I argue in the paper, for me, this was the road not taken, right? This was the road that wasn't pursued um, in the 1990s. So this is a little bit of a, a tangent, if you will, that I'm sharing with you. So let me, let me now 
ask the question of how revolutionary really was this. And you'll see if you read the paper that I try to look at were these very ambitious, assertive ideas actually practiced in the 1990s? And I, with sovereignty as responsibility, I look at it in two ways. I have this framing, it doesn't work perfectly, but I hope you see what I mean, of a positive understanding of sovereignty as responsibility and a negative understanding. So the positive is for entities who are seeking to be sovereign states, th that recognition as a sovereign state should be conditional on certain kinds of protections for populations, particularly minorities. So to phrase this another way, you should only be recognized as a new state and gain the attributes of statehood if you can guarantee those rights. And what I show in the paper is we had a moment of state creation with the breakup of the former Yugoslavia where on paper, this idea was articulated through the Badinter Commission, through the European Commission, that before we recognize all these new states, we need to have some conditionality. But what happened was something totally different. We had a very, some would argue, chaotic process of the recognition of new states that was governed by strategic interests. And many have written about this. But there was on paper a promise to abide by what I would see as an articulation of sovereignty as responsibility. But there's another way of thinking about, um, uh, about this principle, and that is negatively. So when do you lose your rights of sovereignty temporarily if you do not protect or fulfill the rights of your citizens? And of course, the idea of humanitarian intervention is in a sense a manifestation of this idea that you temporarily lose your sovereign right, the key sovereign right, non-intervention in your internal affairs if there is a gross and systematic violation of human rights. And lots of assertions in a minority set of international lawyers in the 90s, but certainly among a political class, Tony Blair and others. I end the paper with reference to his big doctrine of the international community from 1990, where he says, we're rethinking the principles by which we will use force. But when you look at practice, and I have done this in some detail in different things that I've written, you don't see widespread support for a unilateral right of humanitarian intervention. In fact, what you see is a careful evolution in the Security Council's own understanding of what constitutes a threat to international peace and security. Um, and that's very different from a strong, assertive expression of humanitarian intervention. And even the first early interventions on humanitarian grounds that were authorized by the council, you find language in the resolutions about how this should not set a new precedent. This is a unique circumstance. This, so the very idea, this should not become generalized. So in some, I argue here, much less revolutionary than the assertive liberal ideas would have us believe. And then I asked the question, because John Eikenberry you know, said, was this a failure of imagination? Were people just not bold enough in the 1990s? And I said, well, I'm not sure it was a failure of imagination. I think it was much more a question of political will, but also consensus um, on whether these principles were in fact the only principles that were important in the society of states. Um, so let me turn to in, uh, individual accountability. Um, and go through the same exercise. So what we have here, and I was reminded by some of my colleagues involved in the book project, you know, we had ideas about individual accountability after the First World War when there was, you know, movements to want to try the Kaiser, right, for the wrongs. But really when we look, and we, and we also had in the 1920s and 30s, um, the Kellogg-Briand Pact that wanted to outlaw law the use of force as an instrument of or war as an instrument of national policy, right? But we really think about the origins of individual criminal accountability with the early post-World War II period, right? Um, where, as I said at the very beginning of my talk, with the Universal Declaration and even the conventions and the treaty bodies, we had what Catherine Sitkin calls a state accountability model for human rights. Yes, these rights were enshrined, but we were looking to states to give effect to them right, through various mechanisms. The Nuremberg and Tokyo trials aim directly at individual accountability. So we might think these were the revolutionary moments 
But we need to remember a few things about this, right? First of all, the scope was limited to the Axis powers, um, not beyond that. And it was the exception that proved the rule, right? It was only going to be in those instances where you had the complete defeat of another state that you were, you were going to be able to bring about this kind of accountability. And also, and this is something I'd like to learn more about, I only looked into briefly, you had a number of efforts to try to create, and some of you may know about this, um, a permanent court after 1945, and there were continued commissions to this effect, uh, but they did not come about. So we come to the post-Cold War period, and again, in retrospect, in, in a time when we're all pretty cynical about whether the UN Security Council can do anything, right? We had these remark, what I see as remarkable moves by the council to create, for good reasons, but nonetheless remarkable, moves to create ad hoc tribunals to implement the idea of individual accountability for international crimes. So as the war in the uh, former Yugoslavia is waging, you have the US and other states deciding to pursue on, on one track a judicial response to this conflict. And the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia is in a sense revolutionary in its approach to jurisdiction, right? Um, which is different from what we had uh, in the case of Nuremberg and Tokyo, but also in its art in interpretation of crimes against humanity, which decoupled that notion from armed conflict, from ongoing armed conflict, right? Which even though that had been the case at Nuremberg and Tokyo, it was not the way in which it was pursued um, in that context. So that was a really significant move. Also, um, as I alluded to, because it was claiming the right to use these kinds of mechanisms in interstate conflicts as well as intrastate or civil conflicts. Um, so very interesting move forward. And then the establishment of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, where which was revolutionary too in claiming genocidal violence within Rwanda's borders was a matter for an international tribunal, right? Again, so appear quite revolutionary. Um, and important for us to remember as events of, of the 1990s. But again, let's look at the practice, right? Um, those tribunals were created and shaped by the great powers, not the international community as a whole. Some of you may know the work of David Bosco, um, his book, Rough Justice. If you haven't read it, I, I recommend it because he provides this painstaking analysis of what the tribunals achieved and didn't achieve also temporarily limited, right? They're not permanent courts. They're associated with a specific conflict. And they were territorially limited to what the great powers at that time were willing to prioritize. As well, and I think, you know, maybe this is the more controversial comment um, I would make, is that they are pursuing a very legalist version of justice, right? That mimics domestic processes of prosecution. And Catherine Sicking talks about this in her book, right? On the one hand, she's the big champion of criminal prosecution, but she also says, you know, human rights advocates at this time are just reaching for something that happens in the domestic context. Let's prosecute people. And not thinking about the other ways in which we might need to think about justice, particularly distributive justice, redistributive justice, in the context of conflict-ridden societies. And of course, the other thing that happens here, and as we've moved through the last two decades, we've seen this be instrumentalized heavily by states around the world, is it depoliticizes violence, right? It creates these binaries between there are the perpetrators and there are the victims. And in fact, in many of these conflicts, today's victims become tomorrow's perpetrators. And those binaries are much less easy to maintain, right? So I've been criticized a lot by some scholars who work on political violence, and I actually think they have a point for the crimes lens that I bring to these issues, right? Because you are not acknowledging the degree to which in situations of political violence, now the commission of international crimes is being used by states to take their opponents out of the political process, right? To say, they're not just political opponents, they're now on the dock 
as potential committers of atrocity crimes. They're totally delegitimized, right? And I see that. And actually, I have a doctoral student, former doctoral student, who Nina may also know, Yuna Han, who's written really uh, provocatively about this, because she shows when the ICC was created, states didn't foresee the phenomenon that countries would self-refer, right? They would refer themselves to the ICC. And one of the main reasons they've done that is, is to delegitimize their domestic political opponents by creating these, these processes. So um, that, that's the, the practice. I now think when we look back at this decade, and I wasn't supposed to do this for the volume, John Eikenberry said, just look at the 1990s. But when we think about today and what's been going on in Ukraine, but also all over the world, what looks more revolutionary in retrospect was um, the decision of the British to hand over General Pinochet to the Spanish in the extradition request to actually activate a notion of universal jurisdiction. I'm not saying it's practiced across the board, but in retrospect, it looks like the move that was slightly more revolutionary, really challenging our conceptions of the immunity of state leaders um, from prosecution. Was Rome a revolution right, itself? Um, well, the ICC is important for a couple of reasons in this story of liberal ideas coming to fruition in the 1990s. It's a permanent court, unlike the two tribunals, right? It has universal ju jurisdiction. It can act in an ongoing armed conflict in the way that these tribunals could not. And it allows for the pursuit of accountability for senior state officials while they're in office, right? I'm talking in theory. We've seen it in practice, much more problematic, but on paper, uh, much more revolutionary. But we also know that in terms of thinking about this in, in Martin White's terminology, it's still quite state-centric for a few reasons. First of all, it operates, and the prosecutor will always say this, the chief prosecutor, it operates according to the principle of complementarity. Uh, the ICC is the ultimate remedial body, right? If a national jurisdiction will not itself seek to apprehend alleged criminals, it doesn't have a process, only then will the ICC take action, right? Um, it's also heavily dependent on state cooperation to apprehend alleged uh, perpetrators, but also for financial support, um, and even uh, even peacekeeping operations, right? Um, there's been really interesting instances in which UN peacekeeping missions have agonized about whether they should offer their cooperation in apprehending um, alleged criminals um, uh, for potential um, action at the ICC. Of course, there is the clause in the Rome Statute that the US fought for and others that the Security Council has the right to refer cases to the ICC, but also it can defer proceedings, Article 53, any of you who are lawyers, I think it's Article 53, right? In, in the interests of justice, right? We can defer action. So that, some would say, has become a major uh, loophole. And of course, we, we've seen U.S. exceptionalism during the process, where despite the demands that the U.S. had, it still didn't ultimately ratify the Rome Statute, um, but also after negotiations in terms of the way that it has sought to control, um, it and other states has sought to control the way uh, the court operates. This is nothing that would surprise IR, IR scholars, because this is, in this sense, it's very similar to a regular international organization in that sense, right? So I end the paper with the cost of a war because it's 1999, it's the end of the 1990s. And it's when, in fact, these two ideas come together in a very interesting way. Sovereignty is responsibility and individual criminal accountability. During NATO's use of force to respond to ethnic cleansing in Serbia's province in Kosovo. So in January of 99, uh, 99 just as uh, Western diplomats were pressuring Belgrade with military action 
if it failed to crack down on uh, Kosovar Albanians. The prosecutor of the ICTY fellow Canadian Louise Arbour arrived at Kosovo's border demanding access to investigate alleged atrocities as part of an event, uh, eventual indictment of Milosevic. I remember that those few months very well. And I remember many people going, we can't believe she's doing that, right? We can't believe at this very moment of this conflict that she's doing that. Uh, but she was. She said, look, this is where my work, my investigation has taken me. You might have your plans as NATO. This is the moment where I feel I have enough evidence to move forward. Um, and so literally, as the bombs started to fall, she intensified her search for evidence that would ultimately lead to his arrest, right? But that same period exposed some of the, the limitations in ways that liberal states and, and liberal diplomats were imagining and practicing these two ideas of sovereignty as responsibility and individual criminal accountability. Most immediately, Louise Arbour was insisting that her relatively quick pursuit of Milosevic was due to her changed investigative strategy, right? She said, this is why I've been able to, to do this, rather than to the facilitating actions of NATO countries. But undoubtedly, Western states smoothed the way for what she was doing, right? And giving questions, uh, giving rise to questions about the independence. But I think what's more interesting is what happened afterwards when her successor, Carla Del Ponte, took over. And she started asking uncomfortable questions about NATO's own targeting during the Kosovo war. And she was met with either Western silence or indignation as to whether there would be any kind of equivalence between what had happened on the part of the Serbs and what NATO was doing. So there's a, a wonderful quote from her when she realized that NATO was not gonna cooperate from the tribunal. She said, I understood that I had collided with the edge of the political universe with which the tribunal was allowed, within which the tribunal was allowed to function. Right. So clearly we see um, some limits in this episode. And of course, the Kosovo intervention, for those of you who have studied humanitarian intervention or are interested in it, generated intense contestation outside of the West, both because it was waged without the authorization of the Security Council, um, but also because it coexisted with a number of other crises that didn't generate the same robust response, right? So it gave rise to this refrain that we still hear about selectivity and inconsistency. Uh, and I think this is important for us to see. I was really struck by, in my time as special advisor, the degree to which Kosovo still came up in conversations around responsibility to protect, particularly from the Russians and the Chinese. It remained, and even today, right? Um, that conflict still generates such intense contestation. So as I mentioned a few minutes ago, um, in his landmark speech in Chicago, Tony Blair articulated this very ambitious doctrine of humanitarian intervention. And he said it in that doctrine, um, we might be tempted to think we can go back to the simplicity of the Cold War. This is in 1999. But now we have to establish a new framework for the use of force. And that's what he hoped he was doing. But as we know, I wasn't allowed to say that in the paper because I had to stop in 2000. But as we know, um, that, didn't, that didn't come to be. So let me wrap up and, and take questions. So how do, we pull this, how do we pull this together, right? Well, Martin White, if you do go and read his lectures, and I recommend them, he saw a very central paradox in the successive waves of revolutionist and counter-revolutionist doctrines that we've seen since the early modern period. He writes that they aimed at trying to bring effect to unity in the international system, he said, but in practice, they divided it more deeply than it was divided before. So he said, revolutionism didn't unite, it actually divided. Was this also the effect of the revolutionary ideas of sovereignty as responsibility and individual criminal accountability? I think um, the real critics would say it has been the effect. There's a, a book that articulates this if you're interested, 
is won by my former undergraduate, people grow up and do great things, Philip Cunliffe, who wrote a wonderful book where he talks about Western foreign policy as inverted revisionism, uh, that Western liberal states were the most revolutionary and a counterproductive for international order in the 1990s and 2000s, right? So he would say it left the system more divided before. I think I'm a bit more um, on the fence, but I think certainly the ideas that I've articulated to you, um, even though they attempted to recast practices of conflict resolution, intervention, international justice, they were not quite as novel as some would suggest. And they didn't represent the only way, they were the dominant way, uh, at least among liberals, that sovereignty and justice could have been uh, practiced and understood in the Cold War. I think they gave too little space and attention to equally powerful ideas in the 1990s and 2000s. And two of them that I would mention are the ideas of sovereign equality, which of course we know is a leak, is a is an empirical fiction. Russia and the United States are much more empirically powerful than Venezuela or the Gambia. But in the UN system, there is a principle of sovereign equality, right? So that principle, very, very powerful, and principles of self-determination, also very powerful. And so that we see these liberal ideas bumping up against those, um, particularly in attempts to advocate revision to norms like uh, non-intervention, state recognition, or state accountability. Uh, so I think it's also worth remembering that an approach that is predominantly, and I'm thinking here of, of criminal accountability, aimed at punishing those who violate human rights is different from other forms of human rights promotion, particularly those aimed at supporting political mobilization around issues of social and economic justice, right? So a punishment model is not the only model one can have. Was, were, were there alternatives that could have been pursued? I gave you one uh, suggestion, uh, the work of Francis Deng, which was much more bottom up, much less punitive. States still need to fulfill their primary responsibility to their citizens, but they do so um, in partnership with other actors. Um, that was what he tried to uh, promote through his work, not just as um, special representative on IDPs, but also special advisor on the prevention of genocide, which he subsequently uh, took up. So maybe it was one of the roads that that was not taken. So I'll stop there and uh, take your questions. I hope I kept the time or okay. Is that better yeah, for questions? That way I can look at the... Uh... Well, I have a great many questions, but I'm going to throw the floor open to to you. Uh, identify yourselves, please. Anybody? Silence falls. In the middle. Thank you for your talk. I guess. Um, thank you for that. My name is Andreas. I'm a first year MAR student here. I, well, I had a question about you were mentioning individual human rights becoming a kind of operative principle of IR. And insofar as that is happening, you might say that we have sort of moved toward that we have moved towards a kind of normative global constitutionalism, as it were. My question is how that influences the notion of citizenship for instance in the currently in the eu you see conflicts in the between the international uh, the european court of human rights and the individual member states on that question of european citizenship national citizenship does your idea does the idea of sovereignty as responsibility entail this kind of gradual formation of a what you might call cosmopolitan concept of citizenship and then as a sort of afterthought you mentioned it but what are the kind of what are the possible risks and safeguard risks of and safeguard against third states invoking that that concept of citizenship to intervene in the affairs of other nations, which we did indeed see with um, Tony Blair's justification for the invasion of Iraq. Thank you. Great questions. Thanks, Andreas. 
Uh, can I take one more question before we proceed? Okay. Um, Dr. Walsh, um, fascinating uh, uh, presentation. I'm wondering how uh, things play out, whether in the 90s, uh, in terms of your research, or maybe moving forward, this idea of um, negative sovereignty, um, in terms of something like terrorism and state sponsors of terrorism. Um, because, and foremost, in my mind, is because there's no international definition of terrorism, and so the legality or illegality of an of an act stays at the domestic national level, and and so there's this comp. You, you know exactly what I'm, what I'm referring to. So I'd be very interested uh, to to get your opinion on that. Thank you. Okay. Um, both really great questions, and it was so hard not to talk about either. 9-11 or the Iraq war in this paper. In the first version I did, and um, John Eikenberry said, no, you have to stop in 2000. And I said, but yes, we think about these things completely differently because of those two events. But it's interesting you bring up terrorism because actually the last chapter of my book is on this because you see, and it's, it's, it's extremely interesting and I'm going to go down a very short tangent to answer it, but you'll see why I've done it. So in the original articulation of responsibility to protect, in the report of the International Commission on Intervention and State Sovereignty, which was a, like a high-level panel, right? it was not the version of responsibility to protect that was subsequently agreed to by heads of state and government in 2005. It came before that. It talks about the international community having to exercise its responsibility when a state was unable or unwilling to protect its population. What was interesting in 2005 is there was heavy negotiation around that language because particularly developing countries did not like this language, right? First of all, they're like, who's gonna decide if we're unable or unwilling? But there's also um, a, a, a huge assumption around unwilling that is very, very problematic. And so the language of the summit outcome document, when you read it, it doesn't use that. It says, in instances of manifest failure to protect, which I think still leaves controversy, but it's different. What's fascinating about unable or unwilling, and I think you probably know this, this my second um, questioner, is that that's the language that's used in counterterrorism, right? That's the language that's used by the United States to justify drone attacks in Yemen and Pakistan. This state is unable or unwilling to apprehend terrorist suspects. Therefore, we can do so. And it goes back, I think it's the lawyer Ashley Deeks who writes about this, to neutrality law, right? When states were worried about other states harboring uh, rebels on their territory and that state was, was unable or unwilling to prevent those rebels from crossing into another state. We're talking in the 19th century and early 20th century. So the language of unable or unwilling, I would argue, to me, it encapsulates a very assertive reading of sovereignty as responsibility because it, it, it asserts that you must exercise certain responsibilities. And the list starts to become long if you want to maintain your core rights of sovereignty. So I absolutely agree, and I, as I say, the last chapter um, does talk about uh, drone strikes and terrorism in exa through exactly this frame. So it's it's very relevant your question. The first question about human rights and citizenship. So I should preface my answer by saying I'm arguing that in the 1990s and early 2000s we began to see these expressions of the international doctrine of human rights. And there's certainly, you can see it in Ruti Title's work, you can see it in a whole strand of international law and global constitutionalism. I would argue we're not quite in that same moment, right? We've seen some contestation of that approach. So I want to begin by saying that I'm looking at this all, I don't want to say I'm being a historian because I'm sitting beside a historian, but I'm looking at a particular point in time, right? 
But your question about citizenship, I think, is fascinating, right? So what's interesting about the responsibility to protect is that even though it has these links to social contract theory, and when you think about social contract theory, it in a sense invokes the notion of a citizen, right? So a cit uh, you know, going back to Hobbes and Locke, it's this idea you give up certain liberties and in return you gain rights as a citizen. You're in a relationship with your government. What's very interesting about responsibility to protect, and I learned this when I was researching it, it talks about populations, not citizens. And I think there's a really interesting reason for that because there was a worry that states host all kinds of populations, not all of whom are citizens. And the doctrine wanted to give expression to the idea that as a state, you are responsible and your responsibilities will be tiered. Your responsibilities to refugees, to others are different than your responsibilities to citizens, but you have a responsibility to protect populations. So it's actually broader than the conception of citizen. But I do think where you ask the question, and, and in a European context, this is, I think, quite interesting, is that, and I don't have as good an answer to this as you would have liked, but I think there is, because, because I may be behind, I may be dated in my analysis here, I still think the EU conception of citizenship, despite everything, still drives through national citizenship on the way. And, and I'll give you a funny anecdote. I found it bizarre when I lived in the United Kingdom that I could vote in national elections. I was able to vote or not vote for Tony Blair. As a citizen of the Commonwealth, and my Dutch roommate could not, even though she was in the, the European Union, she was a member of the European Union, right? So, <laughs> and nor, yeah. And I just, and I think that shows you the how limited the notion of European citizenship. But, you know, your final point is, have these ideas been instrumentalized? Absolutely. In my final period as special advisor on responsibility to protect, I had Vitaly Churkin yelling at me that the people being oppressed in Crimea needed to be saved by the principle of responsibility to protect. But I would just say to you as students, because you're not students of law, right? Well, you kind of are. You're in a politics program. As political scientists, we should expect instrumentalization. It's part of our life as political, as political citizens and as analysts. What we need to ask is we need to problematize it, analyze it, and consider the ways in which you address instrumentalization. Does it mean you give up? In my case, for a while, I was like, I'm not going to give up just because it's being instrumentalized. But you have to expect it. So it doesn't surprise me. It's what we do about it that is, I think, the, the next question. Okay, next round of questions. Uh, we did have one from Professor De Hoos. Breno, you go first, and I'm hoping that the students will contribute. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much, Jennifer, for a brilliant lecture. Um, I wanted to go, perhaps to invite you to go one step further in your reconsidering basically the uh, revolutionary character uh, of the 1990s. Not that, of course, uh, I would challenge that many important things took place in that period. But the real question is uh, of the novelty of all this, because I think there are so many seeds yeah. that were planted long before. I mean, you, you, you dealt with... Uh, uh, Nuremberg and Tokyo, uh, and you well, said yes, but it was you know the justice of the victors, and it was ad hoc, and uh, it was not repeated. We know why, uh, because of the Cold War, uh, largely, and the absence of a uh, of a, a real community uh, to uh, in the name of which uh, this could be undertaken. But as I think it's important to recognize that. In the realm of ideas, this was mm -hmm. a real breakthrough, and, and perhaps uh, that's what matters most in, in uh, the, the development of revolutionary movements. That is to say, to create the 
intellectual instruments that then can be used when the circumstances become uh, more favorable for yeah. the use. Uh, first point. Second point is something which I think one could add to that, which uh, goes really in the same direction of uh, uh, seriously limiting state sovereignty, which is the protection of human rights at regional level. Mm, yeah. uh, and uh, I remember reading about the uh, uh, travaux préparatoires of the uh, European uh, Human Rights Convention. And really, it's fascinating mm. if you uh, do that, because you keep listening to people uh, telling in the late 1940s, we must limit state sovereignty in order to uh, prevent a repetition of uh, what we witnessed during the war and so on and so forth. And indeed, so they did, not overnight, with all sorts of caveats that were aiming at, uh, uh, let's say, uh, preserving uh, the, the ability of, of states to, to limit the intrusion into their sovereign rights. But in a very clever manner, they could at some stage concede to private persons the right to bring themselves to court. And some resisted for decades. Mm. Uh, but because we were in a, a fairly homogeneous uh, arena, which is, was Western Europe, it gradually became possible. And once the door was open, uh, that was it. That is to say, uh, they were no longer in control. They could be brought to court, and individuals, indeed, uh, became actors of uh, the revolution, uh, just the way you described it. And this happened as early as uh, the 1960s mm -hmm. uh, in, in some countries. So I think the yeah, it's not on a world stage, but again, mm -hmm. uh, an example was uh, provided that this was feasible and it, it was repeated in other uh, arenas. And unsurprisingly, what failed uh, more or less uh, at, at the time of the uh, Yugoslav wars uh, in terms of conditional recognition was simply imposed by the EU uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union at the time of uh, the enlargement uh, negotiations, when it said, you want to join the EU? That's fine. That's absolutely fine. Start by joining the European uh, Human Rights Convention yep. first. That was it. That's all they had to do. Yeah. Okay, before you uh, intervene, no. though, we have our very own professor of human rights at the back there wanting to ask questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Sara Panicino. I do teach international human yeah. rights law. So in part, my question was, it's very similar to yeah. the one that Professor Nehus just put forward. And again, th there were two things that you mentioned. One was the universal jurisdiction uh, argument. People that, that take my class know that I'm slightly obsessed with this um, idea that the future of international human rights is goes more through universal jurisdiction rather than other universal instruments plus the regionalization of this is at least to me this is the trends that is 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 developing so just building on the question that was asked before i was also wondering whether you think that the responsibility to protect uh will somehow be the redesigned considering that these might be the two directions in which international human rights are going or do you think the responsibility to protect will somehow fade out as a doctrine what is the fate of responsibility to protect will mm -hmm. regionalization and universal jurisdiction be able to redesign it mm -hmm. or is it just done mm -hmm. well this is the non-optimistic yep. outcome yeah, it could yeah. just be surviving the way it is yeah. Great. So in writing this, I thought a lot about how novel, right? And that was why I had inverted commas, because certainly I I think when and, and I'd IR has begun to do to do great work in this and really looking particularly at the 19th century at whether IR theory has given us this very idealized idea of sovereignty as an institution, 
and that it, it it was somehow absolute. We had, you know, the historians, Lauren Benton and others, who's actually a, a legal historian, tells us all about stratification and quasi-sovereignty, that, you know, the world just wasn't composed in that way. And that even in the Cold War, which the advocates of responsibility to protect like to describe as this era where it was absolute sovereignty, this is quite a stretch um, in terms of describing how the world functioned. Yes, we had the development of a norm of non-intervention. So I wanted to uh, exercise caution about saying that these were truly novel. And also, as I think you rightly point out, you know, many of the people who commented on earlier versions of the paper said, you know, the seeds of these ideas were there earlier. And so then the question comes, and I didn't, it's in the paper, but I didn't say it. And as a good IR scholar, I should have, right? So the first thing an IR scholar, particularly one who's a realist, will say, well, you can have ideas, but they require a certain distribution of power for them to be able to come to fruition. So the easiest you know, answer to this is they were possible in the 1990s because the end of the Cold War in the United States is the hegemon, right? And there's a certain amount of that that is true. Um, I think the US's own ambivalence about these ideas, particularly about assuming responsibilities, problematizes that story quite a lot. Um, but I do think your notion of, of that the seeds are there much earlier, why we see them in the way that we see them in the 90s does have something to do with power, for sure. Um, but you're also right, and this is a weakness of the paper, it, it, it operates at a global level. And if, I mean, particularly, and I learned this from Catherine Sick, reading Catherine Sickink, the Latin American regime of human rights is so advanced, right? And the European regime is so advanced in terms of that individual right of petition, right? When you think about a subject of international law, it's really international relations that is massively behind the eight ball in understanding how at a regional level. Um, and so I'm guilty of the sin of my discipline by not you know, paying enough attention to those regional configurations. Um, and I think that's right. And if you were going to do this on a bigger scale, you would need not just a chapter. You would have to you would have to do that. And certainly on minority rights, too, right? Like there's a history of minority rights that is really important um, to tell. Um, so I'm very glad you mentioned you mentioned that. And even the seeds with respect um, uh, to individual criminal accountability that come from different parts of the world, too. Um, uh, I think is important. On universal jurisdiction, thank you for the question. I'm actually with you that I don't think this is the only way forward. I only made that point to say that in retrospect, it is the development that seems the most dramatic, right? But I agree that I don't think that individual criminal accountability will only be pursued through that mechanism. I was speaking with Daria yesterday and saying, you know, one of the things I find fascinating about the last five years, or maybe let's maybe even take it back 10 years, is that, you know, if you want to be cynical about international law, you say, well, particularly in an era of geopolitical competition, you know, there won't be compliance. Law is very nice, but there won't be compliance. But the interesting thing about the last decade has been the incredible novelty of legal forums that we have seen and legal avenues with people who have their eyes wide open about what those mechanisms are going to deliver, but they're using legal mechanisms for very particular reasons. So I I think what the General Assembly, not a body that people tend to point to these days as the source of any innovation, right, actually has been really innovative in saying we can't get a referral of Syria to the International Criminal Court because of Russia being on the Security Council. We're going to create a new mechanism, the Triple IM, those of you who know about it. And similarly, the discussion about I don't know how you feel about it. I'm still grappling with it. You know, Philip Sands and others saying we need to have a new special procedure for the crime of aggression. The Gambia's moves to bring human rights related issues to the ICJ. What South Africa has done on Israel. Um, so I think we're seeing all kinds of innovation, um, which I find really exciting. So I didn't want to give the impression 
and you're right that if if you say it's all your official jurisdiction, this is going to be a li- this is going to be a limited tool. On the fate of RTP, I expected this question. It's really hard for me, um, and I'll give you the best answer I can. Right, and and that is, I was told when I was in the position. Are we? This is online too, right? Yeah. Okay, so I I need yeah. to be. I'm going to be as blunt as I can. I was told when I when I was in the position that I held as special advisor, particularly by the advocacy community, that whether people use the term responsibility to protect doesn't matter, right? We shouldn't get hung up on language. What we should really care about is whether we're seeing work on atrocity prevention in various levels of the international community. Are we seeing more mechanisms at a national level, at a regional level, at a global level? Um, do we have more tools? Is civil society more engaged? And one half of me completely buys that argument. The other half is more worried for the reason that, um, and I'll say this tomorrow in Nina's class as well, the responsibility to protect was not established to create new law. It doesn't do that. It was created to enhance compliance with existing law. The Genocide Convention, the Genocide Con- uh, the, the Geneva Conventions, certain aspects of human rights law, a belief that you needed more political oxygen, more political support, and you needed a policy framework, right, to enhance compliance. And so when the concept falls out of use because it is seen as being not politically useful or lacking in political utility or it's too controversial, I think that is problematic. So I have been asked many times, where's the responsibility to protect over Gaza? The responsibility to protect is not just about genocide. It is also about protecting populations from crimes against humanity and war crimes. The Gaza situation is a situation in which responsibility to protect is highly relevant, partly because it is also about prevention. Have you heard responsibility to protect used in many discussions? No. So the question is why? And is that a sign of um, norm decay? I think it's too early. There is a lot of progress that has been made. And for the first time, Since 2018, it is now on the formal agenda of the General Assembly, which makes it more institutionalized than it was. So I think there really is a glass half empty, glass half full story. But I do think those involved in implementing the principle need to be thinking about how to raise its political utility again. So that's my best answer I can give you. I'm going to ask Professor Rachenko to do the next one, but then... uh... The person here in the green shirt. Professor Archenko first, and the person in green shirt. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, am I allowed two questions or just one? I've got two. Two short ones. Two short <laughs> ones. Okay. So one one short one is, uh, you mentioned, Jennifer, the question of norm decay, but what about norm substitution? The reason I ask this is, Recently, a couple of years ago, Russia and China signed a joint statement, uh, which has been recited endlessly, not least because it refers to democracy and human rights, but the content of the terms that they bring into those, you know, this similar, similar familiar terms is probably at variance with how we understand democracy and human rights. Do you see this? Do you see this as a danger to those norms? Uh, at all when Russia and China are doing this. And the second question is this, you know, the 1990s were clearly a great time for the John Eikenberries of the world. That is because they were describing the world as it was. I remember I was at the LSE at that time, and by God, a few, you know, it was bad tone to talk about realism. You were only allowed to talk about Hedley Bull because it was it, this was nice realism, uh, but everything else was, you know, off limits, as it were. So it was great time. But today, it seems that the, the John Eikenberries of the world described the world as they wanted to be rather than what as it is. Um, is that, do you think, is that an uncomfortable position to be in? No. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I mean, the volume, 
when you see it, there's a lot of pushback, right, against the framework um, and a lot of criticism of the idea that this was the decade in which the liberal international order should have been consolidated and made more just and policymakers just weren't bold enough, right? Um, that is really contested in the volume itself, even though um, I think the editors were encouraging the authors to go in that direction. So I have some sympathy for your second question in that I also think, you know, I give my students at Max Bell, John Eikenberry's um, article, I think it's now from 2019, where he says, you know, the liberal order will survive because it's co-opted so many uh, non-Western powers and they have a stake in it, in it remaining. Um, and we always have a robust discussion about, you know, whether that's wishful thinking, right? Um, and that in fact, when we, when we look not just at discourse, but when we look at practice, there's lots of signs that it's being much more fundamentally dismantled and challenged uh, than that narrative, you know, would give you. On your first question, I think we should be worried, but I also think, so as a, I also have participated to a certain extent in Norm's research, which is a, is a, is a, um, is a subfield in international relations. And it's been interesting over the last decade, right? Because Norm's research was a lot about diffusion for a long time, right? It was about here we have these norms, how do they get diffused? And then a number of us, by no means only me, said, well, we should really be studying norm contestation because this isn't about linear diffusion. And so I've done that in some detail with the responsibility to protect looking at Russian and Chinese discourse in particular. And I think what's interesting about responsibility to protect, and I've argued this, is that it is a norm that is particularly susceptible to contestation. Um, and, the, and there's two reasons for that. Uh, one is because it doesn't prescribe a specific behavior, right? So when you think about the norm, we shouldn't um, torture or we shouldn't engage in whaling or we should we should reach 1.5 or we shouldn't, sorry, we should reach one point. We shouldn't let the planet reach 1.5. It's very specific. R2P says populations should be protected from four acts, but the way in which you're going to do that in any circumstance may require something different. So it's not what the norm researchers call, um, it doesn't have a lot of facticity. It's not specific. Um, and so there's lots of room for disagreement about what should be done to protect populations. And you see this in cases that come up in the UN context in the Security Council when uh, major powers are debating a particular, you saw it over Sudan, right? So the Chinese said, yes, we're concerned about the population in Darfur, but have the Sudanese authorities been given ample opportunity to exercise their responsibility before we start uh, talking about additional measures? The other reason it's susceptible is it's ultimately like the principle of complementarity, it's tiered. So it places a great emphasis on the state's responsibility to protect its population. And over the last five years, China's role in debates has been to reshape that. And my colleague, uh, Rosemary Foote from Oxford has written a lot about this, right? So how now the Chinese talk about any assistance from the international community should be demand-driven, not supply-driven, right? States should request what particular assistance they may require, and the Chinese would argue the right to development is, is the most important human right. And so there has been a contestation and a reframing of the responsibility to protect that gives more um, oxygen to its state-centric elements. Part of me is very worried about that. Other, I wouldn't say entirely though, right? Because I do think that when you're looking at coercive measures, and this is where I may differ from some, when you're looking at the international community actually using coercion um, or authorizing coercion 
it should be pretty rare where that type of action is taken without the consent of the state. That's my belief. Um, because that kind of coercion has all kinds of consequences. I'm not saying it should never happen, but it should be rare. We wouldn't want that to be a widespread practice, which is why I think peacekeeping for all of its weaknesses is a practice because it requires state consent that has often been more productive. So that's a partial answer, but thank you for those questions. Oh, hi, thank you for sharing with us today. I'm Tajay, I'm in the MAR program. And my question is, you mentioned briefly peacekeeping missions, and I'm, I'm especially interested in peacekeeping missions, especially more robust ones, considering especially the recent events um, in CAR, where there are some, um, alleged uh, sexual exploitation situations with um, peacekeepers in the region. And I know, especially for MINUSMA, the 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 tensions and the the departure of the mission and ending of the MINUSMA mission, just the feelings and the rejection overall of like mm. international interventions as such, and just the lack of trust, considering all that you mentioned about RTP and some of its the, the, I guess the difficulties with implementing it. I'm just curious of, especially with recent events as it pertains to peacekeeping missions, more robust ones in particular, what are your thoughts on, I guess, any complications moving forward, especially in regions like Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, where there's a lot of conflict, a lot of desire and calling for protections and a lot of uh, democratic, um, uh, undemocratic tactics such as, you know, internet connection cut off and a call for people to have something done about it, but also the rejection happening mm -hmm. um, from certain populations that feel as if international organizations can't exactly do anything. They lack trust in international organizations and they are being exploited by some of the people who are supposed to help. Um, that's a long and loaded question, but I'm just curious as your thoughts with current yeah. events on No, that. thank you for that. So, I mean, there is a parallel story to the one I told about individual criminal accountability and responsibility to protect about the transformation of peacekeeping. The 1990s were the decade for the transformation of UN peacekeeping. And I said to, um, to John Eikenberry and Peter Tribowitz, who's the other co-editor, you only have one chapter on human rights and you have no chapter on the UN in peacekeeping. Like the, there are some big lacuna here if we're, if we're talking about the 1990s. The so some of you may know that Antonio Guterres this summer in July uh, uh, released a new agenda for peace. The first agenda for peace came out in 1992, right? And it was a real, I don't want to say complete about face, but it was a real transformational moment in how the UN thought about the task of peacekeeping. It gave rise to multidimensional peacekeeping not your grandfather's peacekeeping, which was about keeping war or grandmothers, keeping warring factions apart, but you know, multiple kinds of activities. And then at the very end of the 1990s, we're marking the 25th anniversary of this this year, the very first UN peacekeeping mission with the protection of civilians mandate, right? So when I talk to students again, who, think that international criminal justice has always been about individual criminal accountability. They always say, well, wasn't peacekeeping always about protection? No, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Which is why in Srebrenica and Rwanda, peacekeeping troops were not able, did not have the mandate to act in ways to protect civilians. So in 1999, the first peacekeeping operation was in Sierra Leone that had a POC mandate. And ever since, those mandates have been part of peace operations. Um, and this has been another stream to my work because protection of civilians is what I would call a cousin to the responsibility to protect. It's also about protection, but of a very particular kind in the context, uh, at least in the context of peacekeeping, it's about protecting populations from physical violence. And I was just doing interviews last week in the UN about this 25th anniversary and what has been achieved, but also what is at stake as we move forward where we have major operations winding down where it's highly questionable whether the Security Council will authorize collectively a new peace operation. Where will it do that? 
Where will we have consensus? And will peace operations continue to have robust mandates? Mm -hmm. So I think we should all be studying peacekeeping. I was once told by a tutor, as a student, you shouldn't research the future. So I wouldn't advise you, you research the future of peace operations, although policymakers need to be thinking about the future of peace operations seriously. And in fact, some people in the UN Secretariat are a little glum because the new agenda for peace, if you read it, it as I read it, I interpreted it, was a statement by the Secretary General that we all need to be circumspect about what peace operations can achieve in the future. He talks specifically in that document about their limitations. Now, when it comes to POC, though, there has been a massive transformation in the training of militaries. You now ask troops in CAR, Mali, DRC, elsewhere, what's your job? And they say to protect civilians. That is not what they said 25 years ago. And they have been, now that's not their only job, of course, but they say that much more than they would have said in the past. How they do it, whether they have the tools to do it appropriately. And, you know, part of the problem is that they can't do it everywhere. And so in the DRC, there have been massacres where peacekeepers have not been able to, or coming back to you, not been willing, because sometimes they're not willing because they worry about what will happen. And the domestic population has expectations that that's exactly what's going to happen. So there's a massive problem with the operation in its relationship. But the current SRSG in the Congo is asking the government, what are you going to do when we leave? Are you ready to replace us in protecting the population? Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the academic literature on POC and peacekeeping, it shows that it actually works. It's more effective than we think it is. And that isn't the mantra in the diplomatic community, but it actually, social scientists tell us it works. Okay. Well, I'm going to abuse my position as chair with one last question, if I may. Yeah, sure. Accountability, crimes and punishments. Yeah. Uh, we didn't talk about why we punish and what the justification is. You know, classic punishment theory, J.D. Mamet. I remember this yeah. from an undergraduate myself. Deterrence, retribution or reform. What's the purpose of pub punishing international leaders who have committed war crimes? Is it to deter others from doing the same? Is it to exact retribution on individuals themselves? Or is it to uh, encourage states to proceed on the path of liberal reform? Yeah. So I think you would get, I think you would get two answers, right? Um, one is deterrence, for sure. Um, and there's lots of literature out there um, by Beth Simmons and others that try using quantitative analysis and other kinds of analysis to demonstrate whether deterrence actually works, mm -hmm. right? Whether, um, and what, and you hear when you talk to diplomats, anecdotal stories about how particular leaders worry about their individual fates. And that is why um, in negotiations, they're often so exercised about what um, is going to happen to them, right? Um, so deterrence is absolutely for some. Um, and by that, a broader objective of prevention, right? So you are um, trying to hold individuals accountable, partly to deter in the future, um, but also to contribute to a culture of broader culture of prevention, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's what the international criminal justice uh, people will say. I think the second is that it is a form of justice for victims, right? That they, right. if they see that it is a component of justice. I'm not so sure that liberal reform mm -hmm. is as big an objective mm -hmm. as some might argue, but this is just a personal view. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there is... I guess if you extend it to the idea that this is also 
a means of challenging personalized power, mm -hmm. then yes, um, it's part of a broader suite of things that you are doing. Um, but I'm not sure that I would put it in that, you know, that I would put it in that, that category. I think what you see when you actually look at different contexts where we have had prosecutions is, and this was completely foretold, is a disappointment with the fact that, you know, these prosecutions can only touch um, a sliver of those held responsible, which is why I think, you know, transitional justice as a field um, has developed such an interest in, you know, broader mechanisms, if you want to have any kind of societal healing, right? As a, as a tool to bring about societal healing, mm. I think it's not seen as a great tool for that. And does bringing your own country to the ICC delegitimize the opposition? Well, what you're doing is... This is a question on loan. Oh, yeah, and sorry, sorry, that's a question. Yeah, so it's argued by some that it does, right? So what you're doing is you're bringing the conflict situation, mm. and then if you're in that situation, the investigation then of the behavior of different conflict parties or different belligerents, what is argued by those who have studied self-referral is that that's effectively what it's doing. In places like Uganda and elsewhere, it has been used to delegitimize a political opponent. Um, so it can have that role. Yeah. So that question gets at something I said earlier. Yeah. yeah. Well, I can only say thank you. Thanks for coming. Just make a quick announcement. Um, Professor Wolf will be coming to my class tomorrow. If anyone wants to hear more about RPC, technical civilians, civil groups, and criminal, yeah, we've got one at 11. Obviously, there's members of my class will be there, but if anyone else is there, watch that. Can I say your paper can be made available? Yeah. Okay. Just one other thing from me as well. I just wanted to check with Professor Welsh. Uh, anybody interested in the paper upon which this talk was based upon uh, can get in touch. I shall uh, send a copy to Donata and she will send you a copy by email. Okay. Thank you.